Yeah, it seems like the those stories that erase the real history, of course, it is about um, the displacement and genocide of indigenous people, removing them from their land uh, to make way for this incredibly exploitive industry to emerge. Uh, and, you know, I, I think what's fascinating is the complexity of the situation as well, because it was drawing people from all over the place in order to strike it rich as a source of like hope and opportunity for immigrants and others that were seeking a better life. So there seems to be a, a lot of intersecting issues as well as when you talk about in the book about the conflicts, the class conflicts that emerged, um, issues with public health, you know, the lack of infrastructure under development in these places as, uh, you know, the capitalist class were extracting enormous amounts of wealth out of these regions. So it's an incredibly complex, multifaceted subject. Um, yeah, if you could talk about, I mean, this this town of Cobalt, um, you know, what, if you don't mind, I know it's described really well in the book, if you could provide something of a, a brief history of this town of uh, also including, of course, the indigenous people that were excluded right, ultimately yeah. from, from the wealth well, that was extracted there. Uh, yeah. n so Cobalt is in, Cobalt's about 500 kilometers north of Toronto. Uh, but it's mm -hmm. very much in the heart of the Canadian Shield, which is very rugged, uh, you know, r basically Precambrian rock and pine forests. And uh, so again, it it is it is in central Canada, which had no history of that whole mining culture. The region that I represent politically now is one of the biggest mining regions in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, all these mines have come out of the wealth of cobalt, but. So in 1903, there's uh, which is just four years after the Klondike. So to put it all in perspective, so we're just coming out of the Klondike. At the same time, in Colorado, um, there's this massive labor conflict going on between the miners and the capitalists, the Colorado Labor War. So this is all happening at this time that they decide they're going to run a railway into northern Ontario, and it's it's they're running the railway to claim the land to take it because. Under how Canada was set up as a nation, most of this land had been literally owned by the Hudson Bay Company. I mean, a foreign company owned <laughs> all of northern Canada. <laughs> so we were a multi we were a multinational extraction place long before we became a nation. And mm -hmm. the reason they build the railway is because they're trying to secure a claim on this land. And they accidentally discover silver. And mm -hmm. this silver is so rich that nobody had ever seen silver like it since apparently the 1500s because it was so pure. Mm -hmm. And initially, nobody knows what to do. So the first wave of people coming in are coming in literally from, you know, uh, Coeur d'Alene. They're coming in from Butte. Butte is, is a real mining powerhouse in that time. They're coming in from the American West because they, they have the expertise. But what they bring mm -hmm. with them – is the labor conflicts, the labor conflicts of the Western Federation of Miners, Big Bill Haywood, this sort of this wild anarcho syndicalist history comes mm. with these miners because they're the ones who know how to open the mines, bringing with them the Gilded Age capitalists out of New York who are rapacious and brutal. So, mm. right away, you begin this story in this little town in northern Ontario with this extension of the American West and then. To get the mines up and running, you need people from all over the world. So Canada sees itself very much as a multicultural country mm -hmm. and that we see our cities as multicultural. And they often think of the north and the, you know, the rural areas as sort of the, you know, the, the backwash. But the multicultural state emerged in, in the industrial towns like Cobalt. So you have Syrians, Russian Jewish families, Italians, um, you know, everybody from across Europe is here including which again was erased from our history was a really fascinating black history uh, mm. that has just been erased it's like people just didn't cover these families so they didn't think it mattered well i think it does matter i think it makes our story a lot more interesting so you have suddenly in this place and it's a it's the worst place on the planet to establish a community there is no there's nothing viable here it's hard rock uh, it's cold. This is not where you set up a town. And now you've got thousands of people coming in. So from the beginning, you have enormous uh, social pressure, but you also have a community being formed that is completely unlike anything else in the country at the time.
Mm -hmm. So it sounds like these are, this is becoming something like a company town as they would call it, or, or a place where you had mining, uh, companies that are really the, the, the authorities in these towns. (laughs) What role did, did, uh, the Canadian government play in all of this? Well, this is um, I, I, what makes cobalt so chaotic. Is it uh, in in a, it's it's a common practice in these mining towns to basically they are company towns, but you have a hundred different mines operating. So mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. you don't have that sort of central corporate powerhouse, uh, and then you have all these squatters living on all the land because the mines are trying to kick people off the lands because they don't know the silver is running so rich and they don't know where it's running. So it's running all over the place. Um, and the government takes an extremely predatory approach to this. They see this as a, as, as a uh, colony to be exploited. They've kicked the indigenous people off the land uh, in the area around there, the, the Tomogamy uh, people, and then the Algonquins in, in the, the neighboring reserve and then they're ex- completely exploitive to the people in the community. So you're 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 dealing with a community that has badly poisoned water from the get-go, uh, really brutal labor conditions. We have general strikes starting to happen. You have this multicultural community being born in what is very much the Anglo-Saxon state, and it's very much out of sync with anywhere else and no government is willing to stand up for the people the people are having to they're, they're facing extremely uh disadvantageous and dangerous conditions to actually survive and meanwhile everyone's trying to make as much money as possible so they're setting up live theaters there's this giant vaudeville network happening uh they're setting up pro hockey teams because mining money is spending money so you have this mm. this facade of wealth and uh, global, literally a global economy of people coming in and thinking that this is, uh, you know, people are coming in from New York all the time because they're investing. And yet mm. you've got shanty shack neighborhoods and poverty and, uh, and, and that violence that happens in poverty. And the whole story is being, is always about the whitewashing. It's always about telling a, 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 a you know, gung ho story. And I, part of why I wrote, really wanted to write this book is I find Canada writes its history continuing this sort of go, you know, happy, go lucky, uh, colonial narrative that's false. And so let's deconstruct what happened here. Let's figure out the real story. This isn't to say the story is wrong. The story is a lot better when we say, okay, there were indigenous people here. What happened? You know, there was racial conflict. Why was that? You know, what about the 1% of that era that that were so brutal towards their workers. And what about the resistance that happened, which is, I think is the high point of this story is the class resistance, people trying to argue about who should own the wealth of the earth. And these were things that were debated and discussed. We only take mm-hmm. the winner's version because, you know, the state, the capitalist state won, but that wasn't necessarily how it was going to end up. I think people can rethink mm-hmm. their future as the great Joe Strummer said, the future's on written. You know, we, we mm-hmm. don't have to accept mm-hmm. what was done before. Yeah. Yeah, especially when when you do examine, when you do explain in your book the history of, of what happened there, how many of those same dynamics that were occurring in Cobalt and uh, within the young state of Canada uh, is now being extended globally into other parts of the world, where I, I really want to highlight this dynamic that you he brought up in the book of the heartland and the hinterland. Yeah. Uh, the hinterlands, the, the way in which these sites like cobalt of being a place of extreme resource extraction with a massive amount of labor exploitation, of course, the displacement and genocide of indigenous peoples as well. And how that is solely, almost solely completely benefiting, of course, the capitalist class that were existing uh, in, you mentioned Toronto, uh, Wall Street in New York, uh, other financial centers in the global capitalist system. Um, could you talk about that that early relationship between cobalt mining, the sort of mining uh, gold rush boom, uh, and the sort of early days of, of like speculation? Yeah, and, uh, yeah, Wall yeah, Street yeah. and all of that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what again? What I I tried to do with this book initially was to draw a broader connection 
to the to the obvious connections to me was in the American West, the com, particularly communities like Butte and what happened in the West and how sort of that whole West that, that colossus of going from you know basically right across the indigenous lands of the West and the Pacific Northwest up to Yukon and Alaska. It ends up in northern Ontario in the 20th century, early 20th century. So I was fascinated by that. And but what I realized, of course, is this is a much broader international story. This is this is the movement of capital in resource extraction mm-hmm. and untaking of indigenous lands. So when cobalt begins, Toronto is an economic backwater. It is it is not really on anybody's radar. It's a provincial town. New York has become the capitalist colossus. And most of the the Gilded Age families of New York at that time come out of the West. The Mm -hmm. Guggenheims, uh, you know, the Carnegies, they all made their money in the American West in in, in real brutal, rapacious capitalism. And then they reinvent themselves as sort of the Gilded Age capitalists of New York. So the cobalt discovery immediately is of attention in New York. And I, I, what I try to deconstruct for people is that very quickly you learn that the real money that's made isn't in a mine. The real money is made in stock promotion. So mm-hmm. there's a number of mines that are incredibly rich. And yeah, they're making money. But the real money is being made by guys floating all these bogus companies with extraordinary names like, you know, the Princess Cleopatra Silver Mine and all these, you know, <laughs> uh, mines yeah. that they're selling stock And they have no, they're just frauds. And so very early on, um, like, first of all, the Guggenheims uh, get their fingers really badly burnt in uh, cobalt stocks. Uh, And New York gets sort of gets cold feet. And then these mines that are coming out of northern Ontario are so tied to corruption and fake fraud stock that both New York and London start to get cold feet. And that opens the door for Toronto. Quiet little Toronto starts setting up its own mining st- stocks uh, to promote, where in Canada, for the longest time, corporate skullduggery and corporate mining fraud has been considered almost romantic, almost fun. It's like <laughs> I've grown mm-hmm. up with it my whole life. People think that these guys who rip you off in a mining stock thing are are colorful. And so <laughs> – <laughs> International regulators start looking at Canada as like, what the hell is going on there? And what is going on mm-hmm. is that massive amounts are being of money are being made. And the only thing that justifies mm-hmm. this is they continue to find massive wealth. But along with the wealth is all this corporate corruption. That's something that has been exported around the world. 75% of the world's mining companies today are registered in Canada. Why is that? It's because... Mm-hmm. The low uh, obligations for corporate recording, uh, some of the lowest taxation rates in the world, the ability to not have to show what you actually have in a mine uh, for investors, but you can speculate what you think is in the mine certainly helps people who want to sell claims that may not really be all that worth much. So Canada is this uh, sanctuary for all manner of corporate behavior that's some of it's not all that pretty, and some of it has led to some real violence and, and abuse in other jurisdictions in the global south. And that's something we don't really talk about in Canada. Uh, and I thought a lot of this comes out of cobalt. So cobalt to me is a way of saying, okay, guys, how did we get where we are in the 21st century as a nation? Um, where does it come from? And, it, and it, a lot of it comes back to this little town and all the wealth that was exploited there. Yeah, I mean, uh, essentially what uh, I'm getting from reading your book is that fundamentally the same dynamics that w- existed within Cobalt and between Cobalt and Toronto and New York is essentially what's still happening to this day, except it's just been ex- extended to the global south. And Absolutely. It, re- yeah. it really just speaks to how powerful these myths i mean it, it extends to people here in the united states we i'll just mention something very topical which is the um the uh, trucker convoy in ottawa mm-hmm. and of course it extended to other places as well across the canadian border um but here in the u.s i mean people were a bit shocked by something like that they couldn't believe that that doesn't seem so out of character for 
for Canada. It was a bit um, of a of a yeah, just of a shock to I think the United <laughs> States. And it I was, think it was a shock be- to all of us. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, if you could, yeah, if you could, if you would could talk about that sort of because the United States people of this country were very guilty of this of of not recognizing our actions globally, our government's actions globally, whether that's corporate or with the United States government, um, not understanding our own history, right? There is this thing, and and, and I feel like uh, the image of Canada is often very much, yeah, like Canada's a beautiful, pristine state, and, and uh, there's this sort of image, and if you could just comment on how how pervasive that sort of self-image, uh, that myth is, and yeah. and, and what that's is composed of, yeah. Well, I uh, I I do look at that because I I say that we carefully curate our national sense of identity, and it's it's curated from a couple of points of view. One is being sort of the the, the kid brother to the United States. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of a lot of our histories were rewritten. I said the cobalt history was certainly rewritten by mid 20th century nationalists who were saying, we're not American. So we're not like the Americans. So the Americans have Hollywood and they've got their gunmen. We're peaceful. We don't have guns, even though (laughs) um, I think Michael Moore said there's more Canadians own guns and there's many Canadians own guns per capita, but we don't, we we didn't want to have that kind of, you know, most, well, we don't have AR 15s. Okay. So that's, that's a side issue, but sure. You know, that we, the idea of our frontier stories were not going to be like Hollywood. So we were, mm-hmm. we were the peaceful state. We were the get along people. And we, we, we carefully curate that image. And obviously we bump up against reality when we're dealing with, you know, mass rape and violence against uh, Guatemalan women at Canadian mines or um, horrific human rights abuses at Canadian mines in, in New Guinea and in Africa that we we have a problem with that but canadians canadians have curated this sense of self we've also curated another thing which is this idea of mythic north so you you described it this pristine northern land uh i write about cobalt and its neighbor which is this place called tomogamy which is it is considered it's so i can it's such an icon of Canadian identity, this beautiful, pristine place where you don't see anybody and you've got your canoe. It is like the Canadian wilderness experience. And it's right beside Cobalt, which was raped and pillaged and plundered and poisoned. Mm-hmm. And then Tomogamy is this pristine place. And what you don't, what you weren't supposed to see were the indigenous people who lived in Tomogamy and who never left their land. This was a place where white, wealthy people, mostly from Toronto in the Toronto suburbs or from basically the same American communities that were the big investors. A a lot of American money is in Tomogamy and it's, they love these lakes and it's this image of Canada as this pristine North, the sacred North. We, all of our paintings or iconography is about that. And yet we've got the tar sands and we've got massive mining operations and huge clear cuts. And we just don't, Partly because we live in the shadow of the United States, so as long as you guys are doing really crazy stuff, people don't know that that's being really mediocre. And every now and then, some of our crazy stuff gets out there, and people go, "Oh my God, what's going on with you guys?" It's just we we don't yeah. tend to get noticed. So uh, every now and then, people say, "What's going on there?" 